thank you. You too, Remke. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Have you had any uh, topoos uh, to eat uh, today? No, actually, no. For the first time in many years, I didn't. No, oh, I, didn't. No. I didn't really celebrate it, actually. Did you? I, I, I was with my parents and I just, I don't know, I, I, I uh, like cycled across, uh, you know, town and felt, uh, hmm. um, no, I would, I would like the, the, uh, the, the, the mood was, you know, because of Corona, everyone was inside, but there was, were lots of people having fun, you know, family over in, the, in like gardens and so, because the weather was beautiful today, you know. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. It was fun. I mean, I was with my parents today. Yeah, I don't know. We we had some uh, casual uh, time and we had, uh, ate some uh, yeah some uh, tompoosie, you know, a bit, uh, yeah, bit yeah. Uh, the standard, uh, I suppose, you know, like like. A... Yeah, yeah. I just, I just uh, uh, I roamed around a bit in uh, the city, sitting, sitting in a park, but that's it. Hmm. Of course, course you're going. Oh, of course I am. One second. Stupid thing. Or is that uh, is that still echoing, or is that not bad anymore? Oh, someone else will have to say something. Yeah, no, it's not echoing anymore. All right, good. Yeah, it wasn't so much like you that was echoing; like you were echoing what everybody else was saying. Excellent. Was, That's good. It was probably like your uh, recording uh, got like the input of Discord uh, got got your recording probably so you know we, we could hear the recording the feedback of, of it there we go well i'm hoping that this setup uh in just a moment i'm able to god it's just not being it's not working with me right now that's fine i'll just record out some video and uh see if uh anyone on youtube tells me that i'm broken up and terrible uh our one our one viewer on youtube see if the audio is actually making its way through everything uh but I think with that, um, let's go ahead and get Craig in here, and then we'll be good. All right. Hmm. Craig Join. is going to... Did I type lead? I did. Damn it. Someone someone invite Craig and then we'll start up. Now recording. Thank you, sir. Alright. Uh we are gonna this is just a whole thing. Wonderful. Alright. So uh just deal with this. So, jeez, uh, anti Oedipus. Here we go. So this is gonna be fun. We're gonna be finishing out 2.9. I'm excited because then we get to start moving on to the meat of the entire thing. I suppose would be the way to phrase it, if that's fair. Uh, I think it's fair. We'll find out if it's fair, I guess, over time. But I'm excited for that, and uh, we'll be able to do some interesting stuff with the reading. It's good. Uh, I do want to say, uh, I'll just go ahead and kick off. We'll do a handful of quick announcements. Uh, first big one, of course, is, uh, I have to say, thank all of you and good morning or evening, wherever you're at. Welcome to the Deleuze and Guattari Quarantine Collective's ongoing reading of Anti-Oedipus. Uh, we are going through, uh, chapter two, section nine, the process today. I'm, uh, I'm excited, uh, for this one. As I, as I've said, and, uh, except, you know, those of you listening haven't quite been here as I've been trying to get this goddamn audio working. Here's hoping the YouTube feed's a little bit better. We'll see what happens. Uh, but uh, with that, a handful of just quick things. Uh, as I posted in the announcement channel, we're doing a couple of fun movie things this week I'm excited for. The the first uh, setup of all of that is we are finally getting to Avatar, James Cameron's magnum opus of blue cat people, imperialism, and environmentalism that took the world by storm and somehow uh, 12 years after it came out, lost and then regained the top grossing film of all time. Uh, 
it's a whole thing and it's going to be really fun for us to uh uh, go through, break it down, and I think as a first schizoanalysis project, I think it's going to be very fun. Uh, Friday night, for our main movie night, I'm going to be doing a stream of my favorite film ever made, uh, which is Synecdoche, New York. And uh, I promise I will cry during it. So if you want to hear such a thing, you'll be able to. Uh, wonderful movie. Uh, we'll be doing a full read, full watch and sort of talking through the whole thing. It's going to be great. Uh with that, uh, there's a handful of other announcements. Please take a look at it. But unless anyone has any major stuff they want to uh, mention, uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, dive in very shortly to uh, Chapter 2.9. All right. Uh, let me see if I've got a little... Let me take a drink real quick. My throat's... I've been on meetings literally since 8 o'clock this morning, so I'm a little fried. Nothing like Zoom to force you to talk all the time. <sighs> the process. Between neurosis and psychosis, there is no difference in nature, species, or group. Neurosis can no more be explained oedipally than can psychosis. It is rather the contrary. Neurosis explains Oedipus. Then how do we conceive of the relationship between psychosis and neurosis? Everything changes depending on whether we call psychosis the process itself or, on the contrary, an interruption of the process. And what type of interruption is that? Schizophrenia, schizophrenia as a process, is desiring production, but it is this production as it functions at the end, as the limit of social production determined by the conditions of capitalism. It is our very own malady, modern man's sickness. The end of history has no other meaning. In it, the two meanings of process meet, as the movement of social production that goes to the very extremes of its deterritorialization, and as the movement of metaphysical production that carries desire along with it and reproduces it in a new earth. Quote, the desert grows, the sign is near. The schizo carries along the decoded flows, makes them traverse the desert of the body without organs, where he installs his desiring machines and produces a perpetual outflow of acting forces. He has crossed over the limit, the skiz, which maintained the production of desire always at the margins of social production, tangential, and always repelled. So I have a, I have a question. Uh, th this paragraph brings up Brooks, um, and I'm not sure if it's, if we've even gotten to this yet. So like, if this is, if I'm like, moving too far forward in the book just let me know but uh, like in this particular instance this recall reminds me of another part in the book where he talks something about like uh the 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 the, the person undergoing the schizo process uh it basically is like carving into their own body without organs as the recording surface right they're like they've like seized their own means of recording but does he ever expand on how that's actually done, or is he just saying this is what it is? Are you referring to, um, I believe it's a few sections ago where they talk about how um, the schizophrenic use of the second syllogism, or it's in the second synthesis, allows for like a genealogical engagement with the uh, the recording i think i think that also and i think maybe i'm reading or recalling some stuff that's upcoming also but like this line is like uh he carry or the schizo carries along to the coded flows makes them traverse the desert of the body without organs where he installs his desiring machines and produces a perpetual outflow of acting forces like it does does he describe like how that is managed oh uh i'm 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 talking loud uh louder than i normally talk it, it's good on my side dude you're fine i i don't necessarily have an answer for that so it, it, it was more the, the question how you define psychosis or how they define psychosis, right? That, that, that is like 
uh, the essence Ben am I getting that oh I mean that's also discussed in this paragraph I think so yeah but is it your question because I can elaborate on that not not particularly I think I think um right so throughout the book they'll they'll talk about the pressures that the the social body or the socius exerts upon the aggregate of desiring machines through the forms of social repression that act out in like psychic repression and through the family in order to like ultimately create the milieu in which the desiring machines are even capable of acting and influence the recording process that way but he'll also say like somehow or another a couple of times throughout the book that uh the 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 schizophrenic process or the person undergoing like such a schiz like such a process either as a clinical entity or like as like as a like a uh, purposeful process uh has somehow what uh, like, like how in marx people seize the means of production but somehow the schizophrenic has seized the means of recording and i'm i'm wondering like how does he ever elaborate on how or have we not even really gotten to that yet so so it's not that the schizophrenic necessarily seizes the means of recording is that that's what you're saying as you understand it maybe yeah so it's it's not that it's the schizo because they're basically living within a space where they are constantly making only connections uh and it's because the process is basically the connective disconnective constancy uh not necessarily sort of those last few steps of creating the centered subject that sees it in back but they they have that process of sort of creating the bwo when they say things like they get lost within the bwo or they wander the bwo it's not that they are necessarily uh in control of it or holding on to the bwo but more that all they can do now because they aren't able to make connections outward again remember we're talking about their equivalizations of schizophrenia to autism to uh you know shutting down to catatonia uh so at that point it's that they've actually turned themselves and their their desiring machines inward and they're actually only wandering their own bwo it's a that's the process they're talking about the the stopping of outward facing connections the the reason that uh in the board uh the big pushes and they've talked about it in here that the treatments they really push for for schizophrenics are to restart the engine i think is i believe the phrasing they use by doing uh you know hands-on massages and and bathing and you know restarting that by starting the outward connections in order to sort of kickstart the engine conversely uh the opposite of that would be the uh the sort of um the the hyper paranoiac who uh doesn't want to talk about even connections or is maybe moving it it starts getting it starts getting a little wild because we're talking about terms as i understand it they're using these terms kind of in a mishmashed way and i'd love if anyone has an, a read on this because neurosis as an example which is what we've been talking about for this, this chapter and last it is kind of the focus of this paragraph. Uh, the difference between, say, uh, what I would guess would Guattari's view would be more in line with Lacan, who sees uh, neurosis as essentially the human condition. Uh, forgive the wording, it's not exactly spot on, but it's pretty fucking close. Uh, whereas Freud, uh, to Freud, neurosis was actually a problem that, like, that we had to fix and an issue. Whereas neurosis is essentially just the human condition for Lacan. That switch and that change is, I think, that's where my question would be is where do you, where do you guys feel that they're falling on that uh, sort of, you know, A to B gradient or on those two poles? For, uh, for Lacan, uh, ne uh, neurosis is not, um, is, is, is not the um, human co condition, but it is um, more or less um um identifying with the human condition so uh, as a neurotic you 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 are actually um like hyperactive in uh in, in like negative sense uh, as you see sketched out pretty clearly with freud you know which he already sketched out and with lacan um the the neurotic is um identifying with actually 
uh, the, the, the humanistic uh, side uh, of being overly uh, identifying. Uh, you brought up some some uh, interesting stuff, like um, it, it's it's not so much uh, I would say autism, uh, but rather autistic um, um, a display of autistic behavior, which characterizes you know the the uh, the inward uh, schizophrenic. You see like often maybe like even hobos on the street or like people in. Uh, care facilities who start uh, who are schizophrenic and who start to mumble, you know, uh, in themselves. They, they start to uh, repeat basic um, thought uh, processes. Um, so you could say that like they are fairly conscious, you know, of the recording. They the um, I hyper conscious of the recording as the neurotic would be hyper conscious of um, uh, humanism. So um, the, the the schizophrenic the, does not uh, of the schizo. I, I don't know. I, I, somebody corrected me that schizo was an offensive term or something. So I prefer to say schizophrenic now. So the schizophrenic um, can interact, you know, with uh, the recording. You know, he's aware of this, but he does not always know how this works. I mean, he does not he does not trust the process. You know, he he he's, he, he can uh, revert to an uh, autistic uh, kind of behavior, and autistic in this sense is uh, like uh, Blurer's uh, autism. If you um, know Blurer was uh, Freud's colleague, they developed um, a lot uh, about uh, uh, hysteria in the early days of psychoanalysis. And I think in uh, 1907, they started to, uh, Blurer um, uh, started, um, besides, uh, 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 he actually defined uh, schizophrenic as a term. Uh, that, that's probably well known. But he also defined autism as a term, and autism. Uh, for, for him was linked to the schizo, but uh, different from the schizophrenic, that um, autism was um, supposed, an autistic uh, individual was supposed to be more self-sufficient. So they started to aim for this, you know, in the process. So they, they would say a schizophrenic person is possibly, you know, mentally too unstable to e ever become healthy again. That, that was the, the concession to sch schizophrenics. But for autistic uh, people, they, they say, okay, they are basically um, well assimilated uh, sch schizophrenics. And uh, the, the take that Deleuze and Batari uh, have on this is that uh, autistic uh, schizophrenics, you know, um, are in fact uh, even uh, worse off because they are um, just um, too much inside their own process, you know. Again, they, they start uh, repeating things to themselves, you know. They, they, they start to basically um, go even more crazy, you know, because they are so much pressured, uh, because they, of course, identify more with the Udipo process than uh, the normal schizophrenic does. So an, an autistic uh, schizophrenic uh, identifies with uh, the, the Oedipal uh, law, you know, which uh, the, the psychoanalyst, um, well, structures upon them, you know, forces upon them. He actually starts to identify with it. And um, Deleuze and Guattari don't take this in kind. No, that's a, that's a really great summary of the entire thing. Uh, and the last bit to mention is I'm going to, I'm personally just going to go with the idea that they're talking about the Lacanian here. And I think as I said, it, I may have called it the human condition. It, it is the identification with the human condition. Uh, uh, specifically, though, uh, Lacan does say that uh, sort of neurosis is, is something that just most people have. It's, it's almost uh, normalized versus uh, psychosis or perversion, which is the other of the three of the three clinical structures is like the Lacanian triangle because uh, everything's a triangle with these people. Um, the psychotic or psychosis is uh, the foreclosure of the name of the father. Uh, it's the inability to sort of have a grasp or or engagement with the law or sort of the standards around that. Uh, whereas uh, perversion, uh, specifically with uh, Lacan, um, is uh, to quote uh, it's not an aberration in relation to social criteria, an anomaly contrary to good morals. Uh, uh, it is something else in its very structure. It's a specifically about uh, sexual acts which are closely related, uh, social disapproval and playing within that, and it, it gets troublesome after that point. <laughs> we'll say problematic, perhaps. Um, it's a whole thing. Um, 
but here, so to, to bring it back to this paragraph, because I think we are going to have to get at some point, and I think more Ben, that kind of question works really well in when we hit chapter four, uh, because that's when we start being able to break down and talk about these structures. This paragraph specifically is talking through the, the process of desiring production, schizophrenia as a process within that, and starting with the idea of which sort of the chicken or the egg question, which came first, Oedipus or Neurosis. For Lacan, the answer is, uh, you know, the reality is Oedipalization is the determinant factor. Uh, the idea of uh, perversion, neurosis, all of this are about sort of how we're placed within that, how the subject exists within that triangulation. Uh, it's an oversimplified view, but their their flip is actually no. It's not that neurosis, neurosis cannot be explained by Oedipus, no more than psychosis. It's actually the opposite. Neurosis, which is the over over identification and over uh, 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 what would be the term, uh, over indulgence of trying to sort of verify your own subjectivity, uh, that is actually what explains Oedipus itself. Um, then asks, uh, how is the schizo alone able to inscribe a code entirely separate from the that's social just, code? That's just more from my, like I, I'm placing, I, I put these quotes to back up my question and then I was talking with Jack. Uh, oh. that, that's a weird place to jump into the conversation, sorry. It is. Well, this is what happens with live chats. <laughs> it's, I don't get to see it because I'm busy reading other things. That's fine. We'll, we'll come back to it. We'll come back to it. Uh, does anyone else have comments on specifically this paragraph, though? Let's go with that. Actually, this paragraph does give a little bit. So this is what I was writing. About. It does give a little bit in light of Ben's question, because what you're getting here is one. We've got the reminder that there is this tangent, tangential relationship, like tangent in the norm in the in the, uh, the trigonometric sense of the word right or maybe that's geometry but either way the relationship of social and desiring production right where they're at each other's limits right we talked about that when we reviewed chapter three and not this um this tangentiality in the way the body without organs fits into that okay Any other thoughts or comments or questions on this before I move to the next one? There's got to be one. Come on, people. All right. I'll move on to the next paragraph. The schizo knows how to leave. He has made departure into something as simple as being born or dying. But, at the same time, his journey is strangely stationary, in place. He does not speak of another world. He is not from another world. Even when he is displacing himself in space, his is a journey in intensity, around the desiring machine that is erected here and remains here. For here is the desert, propagated by our world, and also the new earth, and the machine that hums, around which the schizos revolve, planets for a new sun. These men of desire or do they not yet exist, are like Zarathustra. They know incredible sufferings, vertigos, and sicknesses. They have their specters. They must reinvent each gesture. But such a man produces himself as a free man, irresponsible, solitary, and joyous, finally able to say and do something simple in his own name without asking permission. A desire lacking nothing, a flux that overcomes barriers and codes, a name that no longer designates any ego whatsoever. He has simply ceased being afraid of becoming mad. He experiences and lives himself as the sublime sickness that will no longer affect him. Here, what is, what would a psychiatrist be worth? Um, it does look like the quote is from Zarathustra for sure. Um, the section, as it opens, as it's continuing, and as you will see as it goes throughout this, is talking about the process of 
schizophrenia, as we've discussed from this point and from this setup, as we've been talking through all of these different things. As we say, the desiring machines create as they connect, as the body without organs begins to be generated, how the social pressures come to be found on them. Looking at the schizo, looking at the ability for us to have these free connections, as they phrase here so deeply poetically, which I really, really love, uh, they must reinvent each gesture. They don't have the BWO in the same way we do. They don't have the socius in the way we do. They have to produce himself as a free man, irresponsible, solitary, and joyous, able to say and do something simple in their own name without asking permission. Just adore that. They are the pure flux, the pure flow. That's the, the thrust of a lot of this, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. I, I want to uh, emphasize that the last slide, um, what, um, what's the use of a psychiatrist here? And um, what, what use could he have or what purpose more or less? So this um, is actually, you know, kind of like what psychists themselves think also, no? So I want to emphasize this line. I, I read it crudely because I have a Dutch translation. And just re read the last line or think about the last li line that Brooks um, spoke about. Um, the use of um, uh, psychiatry is um, de facto um, played out totally. They just say schizophrenics are, it's an illness. It's actually... Uh, the longest existing mental illness uh, from the first uh, DSM to um, DSM we use currently, the DSM-5. It has always been um, uh, in there. And um, they, they basically conclude that they cannot cure or remedy uh, the schizophrenic. So they accept this, you know, they still treat them. For some reason, I, I can't actually, the, the more I think about it, the less I can't imagine, I can't imagine why. So I like this, this, this question. It's, it's, a, it's a very important question. Like, what can, the, can a psychiatrist do for a schizophrenic? He already says, like, in, the, in, in modern day, yeah, like, I, I mean, uh, right now, in, in 2021, they say uh, schizophrenia cannot be remedied in any way. We don't have the pills. We don't have, like, a method. Um, and, and basically, it's, it's just... Uh, something that people just have to live with. That's mm -hmm. all. You know? And there are very, very different takes on this. But the, the essence <laughs> is that uh, is, is schizo is just fucked. You know? <laughs> that's, and, and, and that's just incredibly good you know, to, to treat somebody that you, that you think, you know, or uh, it's actually written down. That, uh, like, basically, this person is fucked, cannot be helped, but we, we treat them anyway. Like, what, what sort of inhuman... Um, like message are you sending you know as a as a psychiatrist with that it it it, it, it like bugs me to death well if you go back to their point too like the what they're doing in the first and span here in, in those second paragraph right is that so neurosis helps explain oedipus and everything right there's a function of it there for for psychiatric theory and, and psychoanalysis. The psychotic instead poses a different problem, right? Which is the, in, in a way, it sort of, inter, this is a funky way of saying it, but I'll risk it. It sort of interrupts reality through pleasure, right? Or more directly, like desire poses a sort of problem for reality. Um, it's like, in, in a manner of speaking, in like the the, uh, the it and the ego relationship very directly, right? There's a context there. But if you take the psychotic um, on its terms, especially without Oedipus and that, and we put it into this framework of desiring production, producing the real, as they've said elsewhere, right? That makes psychiatry in the neurotic sense uh simply unnecessary right because the production of the real how do you how do you work with that right like if you're trying to establish a reality principle and um for the the ego to to do its thing for the id right to sort of help it 
find reality and, and keep its desires uh, object oriented or, or what have you. Um, you know, the, the psychotic and the way Deleuze and Guadagni are arguing here, it's not going to lend itself to that. In fact, that's kind of the problem for the, the distinction in the first place. Uh, Rim, Rimka asks, uh, why do they ask or do they not yet exist about these men of desire? Um, they do this a few times and uh, it's them being uh, cheeky uh, or French, I suppose is another way to put it. Uh, they, they distinguish very cleanly between the revolutionary potential of schizophrenia and the clinical entities that have schizophrenia. Um, that difference uh, is what they're talking about again, um, and it's it's again the cheekiness of the entire thing. So when they say, and it's one of the things again, I get really pissy when people say that we want to get to, uh, you know, we should all aspire to be schizo. It's like no, 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 no. The potential of schizophrenia is there. The men of desire, the revolutionaries, the people who can truly sort of take this. Uh, are they there? Have they been produced? They're they're making this comment about the potential and the potentiality of the process. Again, the title of the uh, entire section. And I, I don't say the French are cheeky. The French are dicks, and they think it's really funny sometimes. And I, I get it. I like it as a sense of humor. Uh, this is them being a little on that sarcastic side. They do it a lot in here. They do it a lot. But that's, that's, that's to me, Remka, that's my understanding of kind of how they do that and they do this a whole bunch of different times as well um they were asked uh it's later on another quote uh have you ever seen a schizophrenic then they say no 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 we never have seen one which is obviously uh <laughs> obviously insane and stupid and a lie um but it's them being sort of no no we've never the irony of this situation with more amusement than we can extract from it the laughs on us they will see what that what we call schizophrenia was one of the forms in which, often through quite ordinary people, the light began to break through the cracks in our all too closed minds. Madness need not be all break down; it may also be breakthrough. The person going through ego loss or transcendental experiences may or may not become, in different ways, confused. Then he might legitimately be regarded as mad. Uh, there you go, Remka. Uh, uh, that's the answer to your question. Uh, really said, I think, better than I did by a wide margin. Uh, it's, it's, it's how you know, it's, it happens to me a lot when I'm reading these books, and it's how you know, at least it feels like, you're starting to understand what they're saying in a paragraph when your question is literally the one that apparently they're answering next because it means you're kind of in the right process, at least thinking. No, don't hold your questions. Let's do this. Uh, Jack, was that you chiming in? Yeah, I was going to say, you can't stop there, though. You've got to read the uh, the footnote that talks about Michel Foucault. Yes, allow me. Uh, from Lang, again, uh, which I recommend, The Politics of Experience. It's on the server somewhere. Uh, I know we have it on here. Um, it's, it's maybe a year old at this point, but I know we have it on there. Um, in a closely connected sense, Michel Foucault announced, perhaps one day we will no longer know clearly what madness really was. Our toe will belong to the ground of our language and not to its rupture. Everything that we experience today in the mode of the limit or of strangeness or of the unbearable will have joined again with the serenity of the positive and what for us currently designates this exterior stands a chance one day of designating us. Madness is breaking its kinship ties with mental illness. Madness and mental illness are ceasing to belong to the same anthropological entity. Um, Rimka wants to break down that last sentence. This will be fun. Uh, also, a thing that happens... Go for it. Sorry. I was going to say, I haven't read uh, The Myth of Sisyphus, but is this kind of like the same shit that Camus was on? 
he, 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 he I didn't have any clue about uh, like serious uh, philosophical. Uh, hey, 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 be nice. Movies. Myth of Sisyphus is great. I love Camus. I love absurd Camus. But I will say it's definitely not this. Like this is not that. Uh, this this is very particular. That last sentence that Remke is asking about true sanity entailed in one way or another the dissolution of the normal ego. The phrasing here, and if you read through Lang's uh, that they're citing here, uh, Lang's entire treatise, essentially is saying, "Hey, uh, just uh, the the patients are running the asylum." That would be the way I think a very short way of saying it. We have the normal ego, but that normal ego is built by the society we live in, the social pressures, all of the connections, all the different complexities, and what we think is the normal ego. And I do not think he means normal ego here in like, oh, that's normal. That's good. This is what we should be. But more the normal ego. Like, let, let me try to put some stank on it. Uh, true sanity entails in one way or another the disillusion of the normal ego. That's essentially what he's, that's the phrasing he would use. That this ego that we pretend we have or that we think we have that is the normal the healthy the and for lacan the neurotic is the normal not healthy but normalized ego yes the normalized ego is the insane one bostgard nails it we're that's the problem uh and that's the thing we need to start from and we need to look at the schizos and the people who are you know not connecting things the way that we want them to and we need to train them to connect things better and it's like no, no wait wait what if that's actually how sort of the process of our existence is supposed to work? You know, actual schizophrenia, terrifying, awful thing. But like Jesus Christ, like they, they're they're connecting cool stuff here and they're doing interesting things that are breaking ground. Are we going to like force everyone to be identical? And this is this is the play Lang is making and that uh, I think it's very clear that Deleuze and Guattari are falling. Yeah, there's French cheekiness. Like, this, this is... You can't read a lot of their stuff, like, direct, and there's uh, Adar first. Um, Roger actually sat with us, and we went through a handful of these things, and there is there is a bit of a sardonic edge to some of the... Uh, the normalization of what we consider to be normal. And, and um, call it whatever you like, you know, that's that's often against but um, I, I i don't think that like anything substantial um, is mentioned here you know so that's why why i i um like well camus is is, is not really um helpful i think to in in developing something that that is past um the like the temporal art like uh, so super temporal you know um, I, I think that Camus is just too, too, too much considered temporality he's hate well come on uh, <laughs> hate um, is such a strong word no no uh, so I don't I don't actually think it's drastically far I think it's it's not it does, there's some nuance I think that places things very different than Camus here but the, the line specifically that I really attached, I mean, this whole paragraph is just great. Lang writes so well when he's really impassioned. But um, the where it says, the person going through ego loss or transcendental experiences may or may not become in different ways confused. The That's such a profoundly interesting sentence. The idea that, uh, and we a lot of people still have this today, that the nature of madness is that you're fully disconnected from reality and you're living in a whole other space. And that's actually even the phrasing people use. But the real reality is that a person going through ego loss or a transcendental experience or a break or whatever in different ways may or may not be confused. Uh, if you've ever actually had or dealt with someone who has actually got a mental illness that is in this direction, you know absolutely that's the case. I had a friend who was uh, you know, a deeply schizophrenic and 100% could handle going to McDonald's and getting a burger and having a really good time and, and smiling, like no issues at all. Uh, and then inside of uh, anything where there was a semblance of pressure is kind of as soon as you left McDonald's. It was a very strange like wall that existed. But 
like that's the point he's making here is we don't know where people are disconnected from or how the person going through it may or may not become in different ways confused then he might legitimately be regarded as mad but to be mad is not to be ill that's not that's not the same thing to be mad is to have a different places where you're making the connections and instead of breakdowns possibly breakthroughs uh it's a really wonderfully written piece uh any uh any questions any comments any thoughts anything 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 at all All right. The visit to London is our visit to Pythia. Turner is there, looking at his paintings. One understands what it means to scale the wall, and yet to remain behind. To cause flows to pass through, without knowing any longer whether they are carrying us elsewhere, elsewhere or flowing back over us already. The paintings range over three periods. If the psychiatrist were allowed to speak here, he could talk about the first two, although they are, in fact, the most reasonable. If anyone in chat currently wants to just start posting a handful of Turner's images, that'd be great. The first canvases are of end-of-the-world catastrophes, avalanches, and storms. That's where Turner begins. The paintings of the second period are somewhat like the delirious reconstruction, where the delirium hides, or rather, where it is on par with the lofty technique inherited from Poisson, Lorraine, or... The Dutch tradition. The world is reconstructed through archaisms, having a modern function. But something incomparable happens at the level of the paintings of the third period. In the series, Turner does not exhibit, but keeps secret. It cannot even be said that he is far ahead of his time. There is here something ageless, and that comes to us from an eternal future, or flees toward it. The canvas turns in on itself. It is pierced by a hole, a lake, a flame, a tornado, an explosion. The themes of the preceding paintings are to be found again here, their meaning changed. The canvas is truly broken, sundered by what penetrates it. All that remains is a background of gold and fog, intense, intensive, traversed in depth by what has just sundered its breath, the skiz. Everything becomes mixed and confused, and it is here that the breakthrough, not the breakdown, occurs. Um, I am a sucker for Turner's art, uh, and this this paragraph very specifically, I, I got lost on this the last time we were going through it. Um, they're stunningly beautiful pieces of, uh, as, as they say, the reality pierces in just one point, but the rest of it makes sense as we look at it. And they are some just stunningly beautiful pieces of art. Uh, his style is is like nothing. Uh, I just love it. I just I just can stare at it all day. Um, the the nature of uh, the one of the shipwreck, which is the boat inside of the storm, as it's on as the steam is coming off the smoke from the smokestack, you can barely make out what it is. Uh, it's it's an extraordinary piece of the storm and the, the rage and you can feel the emotions surrounding but in the middle you can see the paddle boat and you can see this clarity and almost serene blueness behind it the it, it's it's just wonderful love it i just do Well, and they're using this to show us, I, I think in some sense, this again goes back to even Ben's question, right? Like, more fundamentally, how does a breakthrough take place, right? So we see in Turner's work these three periods, the way in which his work is um, dramatically changing. So the assemblages are changing, right? We're seeing how paintings are produced um, in one period that differ from the second. So the functionalities of the painting are shifting. The connections of the painting are shifting, right? The uh, that the third synthesis was the consumption, consummation. I'm going to say the consuming, but that that aspect is changing too, right? The intensities and the effects have shifted in these three periods. 
And I think in that third one, they're locating where where they say like Turner has something sort of like um, ancient about it, more so like a, like they're talking about Pythia, right? And it's not so much a take on like whether or not Turner's access something esoterically arcane, right? It's that once again a breakthrough is taking place, right? So this isn't um, it's not like this has never happened before. Rather, we're actually seeing in Turner's work. Um, a skiz opening up, right? A, a line of escape taking place. Yeah, it's so uh, the order that Ben put them up uh, should be thought of when they're talking here. The the three periods. Uh, I think Ben got them slightly out of order. I don't think he intended to. I think it's just how they uploaded. It's the first one is the clear boat. The second is the boat in the storm, and the third is uh, actually uh, it's a castle, I believe, in outer Scotland on top of a hill uh, is actually what he's painting. It doesn't even matter because it moves from this absolute and total, this is, you're able to see it and able to conceptualize it. And it's like, it's just stunning. Uh, the first canvases are end of the world catastrophes. This is a boat in a storm. That's the first image. It is that. Um, but that's just what it is. And it doesn't, it doesn't convey it. There's almost a beauty to the, to the storm and a clarity that almost seems peaceful. But the rage and the feeling and the emotion and the intensities pour through in the others in ways that is just extraordinary. Uh, and the lake in the third one that pierces the middle. Um, the canvas broken, suddenly it's the... I mean, it's, he gets heavily into this when he uh, goes over uh, Francis Bacon. But the sensations of taking in the art and how it was, how it was created is just uh, beautiful. Everything becomes mixed and confused, and it is here that the breakthrough, or the breakdown, occurs. That, that is the good stuff. I'm a fan. All right. Uh, any questions, comments, thoughts? I'll move on to the next paragraph here. Strange Anglo-American literature, from Thomas Hardy, from D. H. Lawrence to Malcolm Lowry, from Henry Miller to Allen Ginsberg and Jack Kerouac, men who know how to leave, to scramble the codes, to cause flows to circulate, to traverse the desert of the body without organs. They overcome a limit, they shatter a wall, the capitalist barrier. And of course they fail to complete the process, they never cease failing to do so. The neurotic impasse again closes, the daddy-mommy of Oedipalization, America, the return to the native land, or else the perversion of the exotic territorialities, then drugs, alcohol, or worse still, an old fascist dream. Never has delirium oscillated more between its two poles, but through the impasses and the triangles a schizophrenic flow moves, irresistibly. Sperm, river, drainage, inflamed genital mucus, or a stream of words that do not let themselves be coated, a libido that is too fluid, too viscous, a violence against syntax, a concerted destruction of the signifier, nonsense erected as a flow, polyvocity that returns to haunt all relations. How poorly the problem of literature is put, starting from the ideology that it bears, or from the co-option of it by a social order. People are co-opted, not works, which will always come to awake a sleeping youth, and which never cease extending their flame. As for ideology, it is the most confused notion, because it keeps us from seizing the relationship of the literary machine with the field of production, and the moment when the emitted sign breaks through this form of the content that was attempting to maintain the sign within the order of the signifier. Yet. It has been a long time since Engels demonstrated, already apropos of Balzac, how an author is great because he cannot prevent himself from tracing flows and causing them to circulate, flows that split asunder the Catholic and despotic signifier of his work, and that necessarily nur nourish a revolutionary machine on the horizon. That is what style is, or rather the absence of style, asyntactic, agrammatical. The moment 
when language is no longer defined by what it says, even less by what makes it a signifying thing, but by what causes it to move, to flow, to explode, desire. For literature is like schizophrenia, a process and not a goal, a production and not an expression. There's a lot in there. It's the part where we solicit people for the literature group, right? Well, I was going to say, uh, he's literally here talking about the author. Um, and the author is great because he cannot prevent himself from tracing flows and causing them to circulate. Uh, just to mention, Saturday, if you want to join our literature group, they're going over how the author is perceived through the eyes of uh, Bakhtin. And come on, Jack, give me, give me some help. <laughs> you got it. Uh, Barthes, Bakhtin, and Foucault. I really do like their engaged in literature here because they're, I think they're right. Like, it's not a question of fighting over literature in terms of ideology or co-option, right? Um, literature is a machine, at least for Deleuze and Guadri, right? Using that word very directly here. As a machine does engage um, in production, right? It reorganizes flows, it reorganizes, or rather changes connections, changes distributions, changes subjectivities, producing new intensities, right? Because this is going to be important. We get into chapter four where we start talking about uh, the, the potentialities of art and, and um, of art and science, right? How schizoanalysis is uh, concerned with those two and how it's not so much a question of co-opting, but of the actual um, sort of like the production of the machines, if you like how that's going to be at more at the forefront for schizoanalysis than whether or not uh, people are tricked. Yeah, it's uh, the last phrase here when he's talking, I mean, he's talking about these authors almost in order of uh, where they failed to do so and how the neurotic impasse that again closes. America, return to the native land, perversion of territorialities, drugs, alcohol, or an old fascist dream uh yeah really love that so also sad a little melancholy as i read that well and again we're getting this theme of the breakthrough and the breakdown right i mean this is going to be fundamental especially as uh, as, as our schizoanalytic group, right, let's starts to look at the avatar. I mean, this question of breakthrough and breakdown that they're going to get into in 4.1 with those diagrams, that problematic is really critical, especially of having produced a breakthrough, right, having having done that. You know, and we, and we talked about this in our review where I argued the games, uh, the, the Wall Street bets thing actually had produced a breakthrough. And uh, that's over with. Right, that the, you know, it's, it's it would happen, and now it's gone, or rather, it's it's recorded and all that. But you know, now new process is here, and a new process, right? Um, you know, these things are for Deleuze and Guattari, and especially as events, right? They don't take place eternally because it's not a theory logical argument. The process, even if there is a breakthrough, that investment does kind of shift, right? And now there's a new process, right? And while those processes are taking place, other processes are taking place, right? Well, and it's a, a generalized critique of the concept of ideology, uh, calling it the most confused notion because it keeps us from seizing the relationship of the literary machine with a field of production. And the moment when the emitted sign breaks through this form of the content that was attempting to maintain the sign within the order of the signifier. It's a really 
it, it's going to be as we start, especially as we start getting through, and we're doing through logic of sense, and some of this is, is becoming clear about how he views sort of semiotic structure and how art is capable of things. And he gets through this in Francis Bacon, and Glottery goes through it a great deal in Chiasmosis, as an example. Um, the idea of ideology as this separating thing um, that doesn't allow us to sort of realize the nature of, they called it the literary machine, but it's literary machine, film machine, whatever it is. Uh, it's the sort of nature of these arts and these works. It's a pretty extraordinary, um, it's a pretty hardcore critique. And uh, I'm not going to read what Michael said was something that was mistranslated because I'll happily leave the... Uh, apparently, inflamed genital mucus in the original is gonorrhea. That would be... Yeah, I have a feeling that would probably be a big thing. It's a, I don't need to know the French for gonorrhea. That's a, I think you've answered. Now I do. Why, do. why do I now have that in my head? That's not a thing I needed. Why? Oh, God. I'll take you back in the literature then, because I like your observation. Because it's, it really is a question of how literature is produced and involved in production, right? So like, it's not a question of Balzac being uh, creating a bourgeois novel, right? It's a question of the production of uh, Balzac's novel and how that engages production or to use E.E. E. Cummings for really quick case in point, right? Changes the whole syntax, changes poetry in terms of its visual or concrete arrangement, right? Internal and external structures um, changing, right? And you see, like they say, the violence against syntax that it can do, the whole um, uh, order of, of grammar there, right? Since we're talking about syntax is, is and even form, right? Those orders are actually like uh, rearranged, changed, scrambled right there in literature, which in turn produces different effects with what that literature connects with. Yeah, and it's and it's a again a comment that they've made multiple times, and they will bring it up uh, throughout all of chapter three and a lot of chapter four. Um, ideology is this concept that people were tricked. And we use ideology to confuse people and make them think they want something they don't and their argument is no it, ideology sure you maybe you could trick ideology but it's beside the point desire is the thing that actually makes people do things and you can't trick desire people actually want their own uh, subjugation they want their own oppression reich was right and uh it's a it's a hell of a little thing what's the line uh in particular, Reich raised the problem of fascism in terms of how it was in fact desired by the masses rather than a matter of ideology or deception. For according to Reich, the masses were not deceived. They desired it. And this that is what has to be explained. Uh, this is what we're going to be coming to in this chapter as we start talking through what the process is of uh, the forming of desire, the process of the creation of us, the creation of our own oppression. How does it work? How does it set up? Um, ideology is not not part of this and of course that's why you know Zizek's not a huge fan of this stuff <laughs> as you might guess that's spot on though ideology is in production correct and that's the line here that's really important and I keep harping on it that I really love is um, ideology uh, pull, allows us to pull the literary machine away from production and and lose that and lose that connection from the field of production the, the idea that art is a matter of ideology and not production uh, is one of the reasons we've never been able to capture it properly and utilize it but I will continue the next paragraph because that continues this uh, uh, here again Oedipalization is one of the most important factors in the reduction of literature to an object of consumption, conforming to the established order, and incapable of causing anyone harm. It is not a question here of the personal Oedipalization of the author and his readers, but of the Oedipal form to which one attempts to enslave the work itself, to make of it this minor expressive activity. 
that secretes ideology according to the dominant codes. The work of art is supposed to inscribe itself in this fashion between the two poles of Oedipus, problem and solution, neurosis, sublimation, desire, and truth. The one regressive, where the work hashes out and redistributes the non-resolved conflicts of childhood, and the other perspective by which the work invents the path leading forward towards a new solution concerning the future of man. It is said that the work is constituted by a conversion interior to itself as cultural object. From this point of view, there is no longer even any need for applying psychoanalysis to the work of art, since the work itself constitutes a successful psychoanalysis, a sublime transference with exemplary collective virtualities. The hypocritical warning resounds. A little neurosis is good for the work of art, a good material, but not psychosis, especially not psychosis. We draw a line between the eventually creative neurotic aspect and the psychotic aspect, alienating and destructive. As if the great voices, which were capable of performing a breakthrough in grammar and syntax and of making all language a desire, were not speaking from the depths of psychosis, and as if they were not demonstrating for our benefit an eminently psychotic and revolutionary means of escape. That's fucking harsh. I love that fucking paragraph. That's fucking harsh. I mean, that's aimed directly at the Khan and a lot of his contemporaries who were playing with the idea of, uh, and Zizek, I mean, now, but the idea of this ideology that is this, is this play. Uh, it, because it just completely shits on the entire conception of it and laughs about, uh, hey, look, uh, essentially, uh, to have ideology, the, the work of art necessarily already has to be properly oedipalized. It has to start from that point. And because it, it has to, have, you start from looking at it in that way. Uh, the psychosis itself, by having the break with the law or the standards or the way society operates, those types of things is, uh, it's a, because they were, they were these great voices who said these amazing things, but placing them back in the box and saying, oh, it's ideology, it's not production, it's not touching desire, it's symbols that play, and then they play with our symbols and they dance around a little bit and they do a thing and we get tricked. Uh, it kind of eliminates the need to even, as they say, to even apply psychoanalysis, since the work itself constitutes a successful one. Sort of by nature, that's where you start. I would say that uh, this, this thought um, by Deleuze Guattari is slightly, not slightly, it's quite uh, also harshly line with um, Bataille's um, assertion, the erotic quality of the painting, which is um, inserted, you know, by sublimation, uh, they, they, they tell us here, but I would say it is a, a direct um, act, you know, of um, um, erot erotic um, 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 not transcending uh, transgression it's transgression you know total transgression of the um, erotic quality of inner life put uh, on a canvas and um, this um, um, psychoanalysis you know um, is like they, they, they're like um, you know uh, uh, ends to, to like something sweet you know they get attracted to this um, they, they, they want to psychoanalyze uh, art, you know, because it's obviously um, erotic, but um, they fail because they ha don't have the means, you know, to um, to revert the quality. So it it it's um, it, it art is actually, I would say, healthy because it 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 would. Um, it doesn't, oh, it, it frustrates, you know, the udepalization in a way. And I think that's what, what, uh, what, what Brooks also means when he says harshness. I, 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 I think I 
it, it, well, and, well, so there's two sides. So uh, uh, I want to answer Rimka's question. Wait, are they now criticizing neurosis for being used in oedipalization, or am I misunderstanding this? Are they pro-psychosis or not? Um, they're kind of uh, breaking those apart and saying, like, like, like they're utilizing those as sort of uh, like little paper tigers to sort of take down as they start going through the rest of this. When we're talking specifically through uh, this paragraph, they're talking here and with the previous one about ideology essentially being only able to work uh, the, with the subjective, uh, with the, the post-edipalized form. Uh, they aren't criticizing psychosis. They aren't criticizing neurosis. They're saying uh, as they open, I'm going to go back just because it's the, the opening. Uh, between neurosis and psychosis, there is no difference in nature, species, or group. Neurosis can no more be explained Oedipally than can psychosis. It is actually the contrary. Neurosis explains Oedipus. So what is the relationship between psychosis and neurosis? Well, everything changes depending on whether we call psychosis the process itself or an interruption of the process. Hmm, that's the thing. So when we say that someone is suffering from psychosis, commonly it's kind of thought of as both. Uh, it's a process as well as the result, as the thing. Uh, neurosis also, uh, Lacan talks about it as both the thing, the clinical aspect, as well as the process of a person as they're you know, dealing with their own subjectivity. Here, they're kind of going through and bouncing between them and saying, like, look, here's the process of these things and where they break, where we break them, where we stop them from happening. This is where psychosis is, is, is psychosis the break, the schizo process is happening. And at some point we go, no more. And right there, is that where the psychosis comes from? Or if they start going down this way and we go, no more. And that's where the neurotic comes from. Is it that we've interrupted this process and the interruption of this very natural thing that is part of our sort of connecting with things as they come at us, uh, the desiring machines and all of that, this process being interrupted is what they're starting to make the case for that this may be the problem. Uh, at least that's how I understand uh, this paragraph. And uh, please, if anyone has a secondary or different view. Kijk, Remke, als je nou, um, weet je wel, psychoses hebt, uh, of uh, psychose, dus, uh, schizofre schizofrenie um, heeft altijd te maken gehad met psychose, maar psychose heeft niet altijd te maken met schizofrenie. Dus uh, in die zin, zeg maar, moedigen ze, moedigen ze het uh, gedeeltelijk aan, you know, uh, omdat dat dan leidt tot uh, een schizofrene beeldvorming. Um, en uh, dat is dus eigenlijk uh, de, de kritiek, zeg maar, de, is een psychose, is eigenlijk de definitie van kritiek. Ze, 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 ze zeggen, zij maakt niet echt, zeg maar, ze hebben niet kritiek op psychose of op uh, schizofrenie, maar um, de kritiek aan zich is uh, psychose. Want als je dus psychose hebt, dan lever je automatisch kritiek op je omgeving. Soms keiharde kritiek, dan word je zelfs gewelddadig, weet je wel, of kan je compleet ontsporen. Maar... Um, nou ja, daarom is het dus ongewenst, weet je wel, wordt het gezien als iets, ja, goed, psychiatrisch, you know, belangrijk. Maar in ieder geval uh, is dus uh, um, but, het middel van kritiek. But are they, are they basically saying that neurosis and psychosis are not that different, or that they are on, on the same spectrum, whereas psychoanalysis would um, define them as separate entities? Is that it? Uh, you mean uh, in consideration to uh, schizophrenia and psychosis? Um, um, well, also in general here with, uh, in re with regards to literature. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I would say that, uh, uh, that you have two, well, basically two kinds of uh, critique. Um, a, a psychotic critique and um, a, a neurotic uh, Um, kritiek of things, and you don't have a uh, schizophrenic kritiek, because the uh, schi schizophrenic, like, uh, transcends, uh, transcends the kritiek, um, in a way. So, if, if that happens, you know, the conclusion is that um, the, like both neurosis and psychosis uh, are more or less exempt uh, fr from kritiek, unless you are a schizophrenic. 
you know so th 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 that is like the, a bit of it's it's like more or less that they 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 uh, point you towards the direction uh, that they they want to to what they want you to go in you know they, they um that's why why they uh, give this um like direct example of art because art can only can actually better be critiqued by a neurotic by a, a somebody with psy who is psychotic and not by a, 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 a psy psychoanalyst or a psychiatric um uh, sorry uh, um, a psychoanalyst or psychiatrist um, who uh, uses uh, oedipalization, you know, to de describe this art. Uh, actually, if, in, if, if like uh, somebody would be totally psychotic and like he would make a critique of it, it would actually be, be a more fair one, you know. That's, so that's maybe the misunderstanding, you know, of the, of the angle, you know, they took. The, uh, the, the, did I, because you, you, you later uh, added to, to that question, I, I reverted back to the first one. Is that enough or... Uh, clear or so I I I want to I want to take a crack at this really quick too because it's it's worthwhile we spend a few minutes on this because it's kind of the next chapter. Um, so uh, Lacan came to psychoanalysis with the idea of essentially starting with neurosis as the place where normalcy comes from. Uh, that generally speaking, uh, neurotics, uh, which is a sort of an over identification with the self. Uh, that can become uh, uh, problematic, deeply problematic. But neurosis being this thing that uh, is sort of the natural, not natural state, but is, is very common. And that we need to talk about uh, sort of neurosis as being the place where subjectivization can really sort of be held. Again, the way that the edipalization of things works is you've got to be in that triangle somewhere. Uh, neurosis is placing sort of the onus on the child, uh, if there is such a thing, the way that that works. Psychosis is a different place, and that's where they're bringing this from, and that's where Guattari's bringing this from, where they talk about essentially saying, no, it's not neurosis, the over-hyper-paranoid sort of side of things. Let's take a break, step back, and let's think about instead about the process of schizophrenia. I want to read a quick uh, paragraph from uh, Holland's sort of take, which I think helps clean a little bit of this out. Um, uh, it is important, first of all, to dispel the most common misconception about schizoanalysis by explaining to news and Guadchari do not mean by schizophrenia and why they claim to have never seen a schizophrenic. For schizoanalysis, schizophrenia is not the disease or mental disturbance characterizing or defining schizophrenics. Schizophrenics as clinical patients and schizophrenia as a reductive and ill-conceived psychiatric diagnosis result, on the contrary, from the incompatibility between the dynamics of schizophrenia unleashed by capitalism and the reigning institutions of capitalist society, including prima per omnes, the institutions of psychiatry, psychoanalysis, and the nuclear family, hence the subtitle of Anti-Oedipus, Capitalism and Schizophrenia. Schizoanalysis does not romanticize asylum inmates and their often excruciating existence. It construes schizophrenia in broad socio-historical rather than narrowly psychological terms as a result of a generalized production of psychosis pervading capitalist society, a process no single psychiatric patient could possibly embody. Again, we're not talking about singular person. We're not talking through sort of that setup. We're talking about specifically the nature of psychosis as being the departure point for us looking at how things may actually work within the unconscious, within the way that we are created as subjects. Specifically with that, psychosis in Lacanian terms, uh, which is, I, I have no doubt this is where they're pulling it from, um, the is, is ultimately about the loss of the name of the father, the foreclosure of the name of the father, very specifically. That is about having a broken part of your symbolic order uh, that suddenly gives you a psychotic structure, which is not connected uh, to any specific master signifier. This is Lacan, again. By not being connected to the master signifier, you're not having the large-scale conversations that people are able to have. In fact, your words in general may be completely meaningless, despite you believing that they have meaning. The nature of the psychotic structure uh, through Lacan, they're saying, well, take hold on for a second, is it that that person is psychotic, and that's the reason that, that things are broken, 
or is it that they're actually in the schizophrenic process, which is the process of desiring machines, connecting, disconnecting, creating the body without organs, and ultimately the subject that appears as a singular thing that re-envelops the entire thing post facto. And instead, what we're doing is, as they have these broken moments, we're halting them, and we're stopping them from completing it or continuing it. And that halt, that that is what is causing the psychotic structure to suddenly appear. That it is the break that is allowing us to see into the way that things actually operate. And that psychotic structure, the, the foreclosure of the father, all of this is a larger issue as we'll get into in the next section as well, the next entire chapter and two, uh, is peculiar to capitalism very peculiar to capitalism because of the way representation and structures work specifically as well with the way the nuclear family works and things are sort of shrunk on down um so that uh that setup uh changes what they mean and where they start from so i i don't know if it's necessarily super helpful for us to actually focus on neurosis and psychosis themselves but that's the line that they're talking about sort of jumping between because again with Lacan and common psychoanalytic theory generally and anyone can feel free to disagree uh, neurosis is accepted as sort of the normal setup we all want to know more about ourselves and we have doubts and we have I'm a neurotic I place myself in the world I become over identified with myself and I can become obsessional or hysteric all of these things well, that's that's actually that's that's where we can see how the unconscious functions. That's that's what that's what Lacan did, and they're like, no, no, wait over here. Look at this thing. This is interesting. This is actually how we can start learning how things function. So they're starting from a different sort of side of uh, the process. Thus, the name of the section. Does that help at all, Rimka? That was a lot of rambling. Yes, it does. Thank you. It's a it's not an easy one and this is i'm probably wrong someone's going to uh sort of probably put something in some comment somewhere and tell me why i'm wrong uh, which is fine i'd love to sort of grow this understanding but that's uh from holland's writing and from all the collected writings around this this seems to be sort of the way that they're talking about these things um the I phrasing think I've, I've again uh, i think i've again been misreading the tone of the paragraph because towards the end they're again being quite sarcastic, right? They 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 they're going in and out of it. It's sar sarcastic is tough. It's French, if if and I don't mean to be an ass, but it's very French in their tone and a little bit self-serving. Like it's a little eh, like we've got that set up. Actually, uh, at Addy Addy, uh, that's basically fantastic diagram that explains the difference actually between neurosis and psychosis um, the the first one which is uh the red and the blue uh think of it as uh disparate master signifiers in the way that they connect uh the neurotic has things tightly in order very set up over focused on it if anything but this organization this master signifier and signification of language and our unconscious allows us to have order and this allows us to understand actually how we really exist if that breaks and it breaks when someone has foreclosed upon the name of the father whatever um suddenly they no longer have the thing that leads it or where things are supposed to connect and they make bridges that no one else would uh and it's not as uh was said earlier by uh god damn it i'm gonna forget everyone's name as i read through this um lang uh who said uh where is it madness need not all be break down it may also be break through uh that image clearly marks how that can happen but we'll get to the rest in just a moment too because we're about to continue into uh, a lot more arto which is great Um, we're at the bottom of 133. Uh, are we at the bottom of 133? I have 
I'm still, still just reversing. Fair enough. Uh, here again, edipalization is one of the most important factors. Is that the next? Yeah, I think so. Oh wait, no, I just, I think I just, did I just read that? I did. No, yeah, you did, so it's going to be... It is it correct. Is correct. <sighs> uh, it is correct to measure established literature against an Oedipal psychoanalysis, for this literature deploys a form of superego proper to it, even more noxious than the non-written superego. Oedipus is in fact literary before being psychoanalytic. There will always be a Breton against Artaud, a Goethe against Lenz, a Schiller against Holderlin, in order to superegoize literature and tell us, careful, go no further, no errors for a lack of tact. Werther, yes, Lenz, no. The Oedipal form of literature is its commodity form. We are free to think that there is finally even less dishonesty in psychoanalysis than in the established literature, since the neurotic, pure and simple, produces a solitary work irresponsible, illegible, and non-marketable, which on the contrary must pay not only to be read, but to be translated and reduced. He makes at least an economic error, an error in tact, and does not spread his values. Artaud puts it well, all writing is so much pig shit. That is to say, any literature that takes itself as an end or sets ends for itself, instead of being a process that plows the crap of being and its language, transports the weak, the aphasiacs, the illiterate. At least spare us sublimation. Every writer is a sellout. The only literature is that which places an explosive device in its package, fabricating a counterfeit currency, causing the superego and its form of expression to explode, as well as the market value of its form of content. This is it. I'm still harsh. I'm still going to say harsh. Like, it's it's... There's a little bit more anger in this one, uh, obviously. But again, their sort of core point, uh, the way that the way that the neurotic writes, and I, there is uh, a lot of people in, uh, let's say, theory Twitter and theory circles or writers in this who are happy to be that neurotic as well. So it's kind of a direct dig on a lot of people. Pretty great. Any questions, comments, thoughts on this little bit? So I'll keep going. Uh, we're actually going to get to a very, very specific quote that I love. Uh, also, Rimka, that's about your earlier question, so we'll get there. I don't know if this has to do with the counterfeiters, but I saw it. I have no idea. Um, that one hasn't come up. Maybe. I, I, I do think, think it's... No, go ahead. Uh, the lose uh, in Odd Cinema... Uh, especially he he really doesn't like sort of like the the vacuous consumption of entertainment uh and he's very critical of people who like just consume movies as they're presented or like uh um Like, I also think that's going to extend to, like, works of uh, literature that are, like, uh, you know, like, young adult or new adult novels or, like, uh, like, like, pop fantasy and stuff uh, that don't really say anything at all. They just, like, repeat stuff that's already been said. Like, Deleuze is really only interested in movies or books that, like cause people to think while they're like interacting with them and not not like think as in like use your imagination but like think think the unique like think the original yeah don't don't utilize the structures that came before the uh, as he says in a lot of pieces, uh, be aware of the cliches and destroy them first. Love it. I'm going to continue, though, because it's staying more on that point. But some reply. 
Our toad does not belong to the realm of literature. He is outside it because he is schizophrenic. Others retort, he is not schizophrenic since he belongs to literature and the most important literature at that, the textual. Both groups hold at least one thing in common. They subscribe to the same puerile and reactionary conception of schizophrenia and the same marketable neurotic conception of literature. A shrewd critic writes, a shrewd critic writes, one need understand nothing of the concept of the signifier in order to declare absolutely that Artaud's language is that of a schizophrenic. The psychotic produces an involuntary discourse, fettered, subjugated, therefore, in all respects, the contrary of textual writing. But what is this normal te enormous textual archaism, the signifier, that subjects literature to the mark of castration and sanctifies the two aspects of its edible form? And who told this shrewd critic that the discourse of the psychotic was involuntary, fettered, subjugated? Not that it is more nearly the opposite, thank God. But these very oppositions are singularly lacking in relevance. Artaud makes a shambles of psychiatry precisely because he is schizophrenic and not because he is not. Artaud is the fulfillment of literature precisely because he is schizophrenic and not because he is not. It has been a long time since he broke down the wall of the signifier. Artaud is schizo. From the depths of his suffering and his glory, he has the right to denounce what society makes of the psychotic in the process of decoding the flows of desire. Van Gogh, the man suicided by society. But also what it makes of literature when it opposes literature to psychosis in the name of a neurotic or perverse recoding. Lewis Carroll, or the coward of the Belle Lettre. Just great. Uh, again, uh, I, I, sorry, I, go for yeah, it. I, 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 yeah, I also wanted to say again, because like th this is the point I said previously, that Van Gogh, because he is like um, a psychotic, is more um, no, uh, ready or appropriate to actually make art, to critique all, all the forms of art by creating art than um, would be uh, a healthy or psychoanalytical individual I, I have to laugh because it made me think of like a Freud's son he made some art uh, I'll, I'll try uh, looking it up it's it's really it's really awful you know <laughs> does anyone have any other comments on this before I continue on that work because They've gone through our, our toe a little bit, and we're about to get back to Lang very quickly, so I thought I'd stop because I know we have a few Arto fans here. And I would recommend, I posted a link to it. If you haven't read uh, Van Gogh, The Suicide Provoked by Society, um, yeah, I, I think this is a good translation. I not positive, but I find it to be a um, wonderful, very short piece um, about what makes someone a lunatic, what makes someone a madman, um, and how that works. And uh, there's a handful, there's one line talking about uh, Van Gogh. The cutoff ear was straightforward logic. I repeat, a world which every day and night increasingly eats the uneatable in order to adapt its bad faith to its own ends is forced, as far as this bad faith is concerned, to keep it under lock and key. So, fucking really great writing. I love Arto. Some of that stuff's really, really amazing. But I would suggest it. And uh, uh, again, talking through the idea of how through the ideology of a thing um we're not dealing with the production of it or the way desire moves through it that's the last few paragraphs again to try to resum that up we're not anymore talking about hey <laughs> hey uh you know what does this kind of mean well let's look at it through an ideological perspective it's like no look you have all of these directions we you try to do that but you start with ideology you place it into this hyper subjective thing of where the artist is at ideologically where are you at ideologically where the subject is and it's you know we can do that as they say 
um, from the depths of his suffering glory as the right to denounce society, but also make what it makes of literature when it opposes literature to psychosis in the name of a neurotic or perverse recoding. And Lewis Carroll being one of Deleuze's, I think, favorite authors of that direction, that we're not touching into ideology. All of these things can sort of play within this triangulation. We'll get into that more in a second, but it's just great. Just like that. <sighs> How'd you like to be called out by Deleuze as the shrewd critic? I have a feeling, by the way, that's sarcastic. <laughs> Jesus. All right. Uh, we'll continue to the next. Very few accomplish what Lang calls the breakthrough of the schizophrenic wall or limit. Quite ordinary people, nevertheless. But the majority draw near the wall and back away horrified. Better to fall back under the law of the signifier, marked by castration, triangulated in Oedipus. So they displace the limit, they make it pass into the interior of the social formation, between the social production and reproduction that they invest, and the familial reproduction that they fall back on, to which they apply all the investments. They make the limit pass into the interior of the domain thus described by Oedipus, between the two poles of Oedipus. They never stop involuting and evolving between the two poles, Oedipus as the last rock and castration as the cavern, the ultimate territoriality, although reduced to the analyst couch, rather than the decoded flows of desire that flee, sip away, and take us where? Such is neurosis, the displacement of the limit in order to create a little colonial world of one's own. But others want virgin lands, more truly exotic, Families more artificial, societies more secret, that they design and institute along the length of the wall, in the locales of perversion. Still others, sickened by the utility, the utility of Oedipus, but also by the shoddiness and asceticism of perversions, reach the wall and rebound against it, sometimes with an extreme violence. Then they become immobile, silent, they retreat to the body without organs. Still a territoriality, but this time totally desert-like, where all desiring production is arrested, where it becomes rigid, feigning stoppage, psychosis. There you go, Rimka. That's how they're defining it. Out. Nice and clear. Um, I'll I have the next. Uh, go for it. It's not really like much. It's just sort of like an interesting uh intratextual reference uh earlier when Deleuze is talking about like different kinds of people uh he he like lists the uh he, he talks about the perverts and they say uh they play the game all the way to the hilt which i mean that's already a fun double entendre but here again we 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 find them talking about like the people living like in the perverse are the ones that are living right up against the wall without interacting with it violently uh, so Remka, uh let's think of the the three the psychotic the neurotic and uh what is the last of the the last of those i can never remember the third uh perversion the perverts um which is not directly necessarily sexual perversions its own thing so let's talk about the edge of society, the edge of what madness is and stepping over that line. Let's just forget everything. Let's talk about people who run towards that wall and get at it. Generally speaking, it's everybody. Like everyone's always like wanting to continue moving. But that wall, that limit, uh, what happens to people there is the point. To them, to, to Deleuze and Guattari, it's not that we start as a neurotic or that we've been made into one it's that our desire is constantly going out constantly connecting constantly trying to do new shit and then we hit this wall now do we break through no no it's brave oedipus and a whole bunch of other shit is really stopping us from doing that especially capital how do we sit and live within process how do we constantly change how do we hit the revolution well we don't so the first thing that happens is most people and it says uh the majority draw near the wall and back away horrified. Oh, fuck. That's too much change. I don't know if I need that much change. And it's better, really. I mean, come on. I want to, you know, be under the law of the signifier marked by castration, triangulated in Oedipus. Oh, good. So they displace the limit. 
they make it pass into the interior of social formation. The, they make it sort of sit within, you know, the way society between social production, reproduction, they invest in familial reproduction. They fact, fall back on the nuclear family, the way capital works. All of this is good. It's, it's comforting to the neurotic, which is most people. Uh, then the, the second, which is the perversion, uh, they kind of run at the wall and they go, oh, this is, oh, shit, there's some cool shit here. I like this. This is weird. This is weird shit here. I like this. Uh, this is cool. Let's 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 hang out here for a while and sit inside of perversion, which is, again, desire being at that edge. It's not, you know, directly you know, under any specific signification. All of that. They're kind of at the at the edge of it. But that's their thing is they sit there. Uh, and the third is uh, the psychotic which is one who hits that wall and just can barely handle that. And they either, like they basically violently react and shut down. And that's the, the psychotic break, the ones who can no longer deal with the master signifier, the, the way language works, the society at large. This is who they see as Again, the, the psychotic, the chance for us to look at, here's actually the process. This is how connections work and how we force things. Again, starting with desire as the place, but not stopping at uh, neurosis, but instead saying neurosis is just this comforting thing Oedipus does that allows us to sort of live in inside of a place and have our own oppression and desire our own oppression even. But the psychotic, they break. Now they, when they break, they're no longer connecting. Uh, they're no longer connecting at all. They they pull back. And that that territoriality that is desert-like doesn't have the signs on it to connect. That's the, the phrasing they're using. This is why someone becomes uh, to them. This is why someone re regresses and, and shuts down and becomes catatonic and, and is useless to society. And it's not that they are psychotic. It's that their desiring machines simply shut down because there's there's no desire to connect with this shit they're, they're not going to be edipalized and there's no option they're at the edge either they stay there perverted or they bounce back or they shut down that's it um, uh, the people who break through the wall um, yeah no we'll, we'll get to it again Remka don't worry uh, this is not, welcome to the questions they've been doing a lot of building up towards this and what is coming in the next chapter and then the chapter after there's this is where things get long and a lot of paragraphs are going to take us an hour to discuss once in a while. It's or even longer. Uh, it's going to happen. Um, Postcard, who are the very few that accomplish the breakthrough of the schizophrenic wall? Are those the writers or painters we've mentioned so far? Yes. Uh, and they also fall back inside of it or things ruin them or whatever. That's the, the freedom inside of uh, the literature they were just talking about or art or other things. Um, but I do want to get to the next paragraph uh, because it continues the talking about the psychotic. These catatonic bodies have fallen into the river like lead weights, immense transfixed hippopotamuses who will not come back up to the surface. They have entrusted all their forces to primal repression in order to escape the system of social and psychic repression that fabricates neurotics. But a more naked repression befalls them that declares them identical with the hospital schizo, the great autistic one, the clinical entity that lacks Oedipus. Why the same word schizo to designate both the process insofar as it goes beyond the limit and the result of the process insofar as it runs up against the limit and pounds endlessly away there? Why the same word to designate both the eventual breakthrough and the possible breakdown and all the transitions and intricacies of the two extremes? In point of fact, of the three preceding adventures, the adventure of psychosis is the most intimately related to the process, in the sense of Jasper's demonstration when he shows that the demonic, ordinarily repressed, erupts by means of such a state, or gives rise to such states which endlessly run the risk of making it topple into breakdown or disintegration. I'm just going to continue, because I want to finish, and I think the discussion continues there. We no longer know if it is the process that must truly be called madness, the sickness being only disguise or caricature, or if the sickness is only our only madness and the process our only cure. 
But in any case, the intimate nature of the relationship appears directly in inverse ratio. The more the process of production is led off course, brutally interrupted, the more the schizo as entity arises as a specific product. That is why, on the other hand, we were unable to establish any direct relationship between neurosis and psychosis. The relationships of neurosis, psychosis, and also perversion depend on the situation of each one with regard to the process and on the manner in which with each uh, manner in which each one represents a mode of interruption of the process, a residual bit of ground to which one clings so as not to be carried off by the deterritorialized flows of desire. Neurotic territoriality of Oedipus, perverse territorialities of the artifice, psychotic territorialities of the body without organs. Sometimes the process is caught in the trap and made to turn about within the triangle. Sometimes it takes itself as an end in itself, other times it continues on in the void and substitutes a horrible exasperation for its fulfillment. Each of these forms has schizophrenia as a foundation. Schizophrenia as a process is the only universal. Schizophrenia is at once the wall, the breaking through this wall, and the failures of this breakthrough. How does one get through this wall? For it is useless to hit it hard. It has to be undermined and penetrated with a file, slowly and with patience, as I see it. What is at stake is not merely art or literature. For either the artistic machine, the analytical machine, and the revolutionary machine will remain in extrinsic relationships that make them function in the deadening framework of the system of social and psychic repression, or they will become parts and cogs of one another in the flow that feeds one in the same desiring machine. So many local fires patiently kindled for a generalized explosion, the skiz and not the signifier. Yeah, it's a fucking good ending. Um, I hope, I hope, at least in a in intuitive way, it's able to start being communicated. There's a lot in this that I'm also like still as I'm rereading this, I'm like readjusting my understanding of the terms and the representations as I as I grasp them. But uh, to just very clearly say again, we're talking about the process. We're not talking about that people start as a neurotic, start as a psychotic, that it's determinate, that this is about the interruptions thereof and how hard we push against it. Uh, the process of existence, the process of the schizo being the core underlying thing that seems to be underneath it all. Would anyone like to give thoughts? It's, a, it's open. Well, I will assume that that means no, that everyone fully grasped this, and I'm just impressed by all of you for being so much smarter than me. <laughs> it's, uh, you may not have questions right away. This is, uh, this is the end of, uh, chapter two. We've now gone through the nature of familialism, the nature of the process, the nature of their critique, their autocritique, essentially, of, uh, psychoanalysis that is this entire chapter. It is a lot. It is a lot. Um, I think it would be probably smart for us to set up a, uh, maybe a, a midweek review like we, we used to do um, Thursday or Friday, where we uh, welcome everyone to just come ask questions after you've had some time to, uh, you know, adjust, think through it, uh, take questions from anyone who sort of wants to about chapter two and the concepts that are brought up in it. I will say 
a good deal of this also uh, is insistent on some other things that are going to be explained more in chapter three. Uh, but I think that may be a good idea for us to sort of redo, break down, and go back through uh, the process of all of it, not just you know, not just the process, which is the name of the section, but the entire all entirety of chapter two. Any thoughts on that? Sounds good. All right. Well, be be watching for that. Um, maybe we'll do a few announcements. Uh, uh, try to see who we can get for it. I think it's probably the best idea. So we'll we'll figure out a time this week when we can do that and charge through it, because it's it's a lot, and um, we're about to get into the the socius, and if we don't have a firm grasp on their take of how desiring machines operate, their take of how they form our, the unconscious or the process and how it works, it's going to be very difficult for us to talk about how desiring production functions at the molar, uh, which is the larger scale of things. So it's really going to be worthwhile for us. Is, are there any questions right now? Or I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, kill the recording and everything and we'll finish up. All right. Well, then, uh, it's been wonderful having all of you join. If uh, you feel like it, feel free to follow us on Twitter, D and G Q C, uh, Patreon, D G Q C, D G Q C also on uh, Instagram, but I don't post there because I don't like Instagram. Um, if anyone wants to run, run Instagram, I'm continuing to offer it up to anyone who wants it. I don't really care. Uh, yours for fun. I have fun. Um, other than that, uh, thank all of you very much, and I look forward to where this goes.